And welcome to the Justice Committee's 18th minute, uh, meeting of 2018. We have apologies from Ben McPherson. Agenda item one is the decision on taking item three, which is consideration of our work programme, and item four, which is consideration of a draft report on remand in private. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed, thank you. Agenda item two is a roundtable evidence session on defamation. Earlier this year, the committee received a briefing from the Scottish Law Commission on its report and draft bill on defamation. And the purpose of today's roundtable session is to um, discuss in more detail the Commission's recommendation and other issues relating to the reform of defamation in Scotland. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I, I welcome the witnesses to the round table um, discussion this, uh, this morning. And it's always quite good just to do introductions right round the table and to explain that the, the round table, while informal, is still an evidence session, but does uh, allow, I think, a better and freer interchange of, of views um, and if you want to to indicate you want to speak if you just um, attract my attention of the clerks then we'll make sure you're on the list there's no need to um, press any buzzers as if by magic then um, our sound technicians will make sure that when you want to speak your microphone is live to be heard so if we can start with the introductions I'm Margaret Mitchell the convener of the committee I'm Gail Scott, I'm one of the clerks to the committee. I'm Stephen Imrie, I'm also one of the clerks to the committee. I'm Jenny Glruth, the MSP for Midfife and Glenothis. I'm Campbell Dean, I'm a partner of Banasign Kirkwood France and Company Solicitors. I'm Rosalind McInnes, I'm Principal Solicitor of BBC Scotland and the author of Scots Law for Journalists. I'm Mara, good morning, John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. I'm John Paul Sheridan from the Law Society of Scotland. I'm Liam MacArthur, the MSP for Orkney. Liam Kerr, MSP for the North East Region. Morris Corrias, MSP for West Scotland Region. I'm Gavin Souter. I'm a, an academic at uh, Queen Mary University of London, but uh, originally from Northern Ireland. And uh, I've been interested in defamation reform for a long time. So thank you for the opportunity to come along and talk about it. Mary Goujon, I'm the MSP for Angus North and Mearns. Uh, George Adam, Paisley's MSP. And I'm Nick Williams, the project manager of Scottish Pen. I'm Daniel Johnson, MSP for Edinburgh Southern. I'm Rona Mackay, MSP for Strathkelvin and Bearsden, and Deputy Convener of the Committee. Okay. I thought that we could start with a very general question. The law of defamation in Scotland hasn't been updated since 1996. Why is there a need to do so now? And if we could hear views round the panel, anyone want to kick off? Not looking at anyone in particular? Nick. I think, I mean, how we communicate, how we express ourselves has drastically changed since then. Obviously, new media and social media, but also the changing realities around um, newspaper and more conventional media. I think there's huge um, issues that were point, um, brought up in 2013 in England and Wales, which, which necessitated that reform. And I think Scotland needs to sort of take the lead, not just for harmonisation, but to ensure that people are protected, whether it's on Twitter or a letter to the editor or anything, anything such. Okay. Anyone else like to go next? I'm not going to disagree with what, what Nick's saying there. <laughs> there is, yep. there is a, um, the law hasn't changed. The law tends to be based, um, or the principles of law tend to be based on cases going back to the mid 1800s, late 1800s. Now, arguably, they are transferable to modern um, day scenarios, but it does involve an element of contortion to get there, and it may well be advisable on that basis to, to look at it afresh. Okay, anyone else? Northland? Just on, on the basis of law reform, generally what the Scottish Law Commission is for, um, absolutely endorse what Nick and Campbell have said, but also there were bits of Scots law in this which emerging were always a bit of a dog's breakfast, to be honest, like the verbal injury element. That's not, so just from the point of view of law reform, um, in, with a view to making law more coherent and particularly more comprehensible by lay people, I think the bill is a really good idea. It wouldn't be the contentious stuff, but it's, I think it's important. Yeah. Gavin or John Paul, the only two that haven't proffered opinion? Very clearly, uh, the two words that spring to mind are the internet, uh, with tremendous revolutions twice. The internet revolutionized communication in terms of availability, cross-border, 
internationalised everything. That's a huge issue. And then with Web2 and the fact that there's so much generated user content now and the varied questions about liability for that and the ease with which so much of that arises in a context where you've got bloggers and people pumping out stuff that isn't thought through, isn't passed through a duty solicitor the way you would traditional media and so on. And I think as Rosalind has said, there also over time historically there's been stuff that has evolved that maybe isn't the best and it's a chance to clarify and amend and address other issues that are problematic, not necessarily because of the web. Okay, and John Paul. We're very, we're very supportive of, of, of the amendments and, and bringing the law up to date, um, just for the reasons others have said. Um, in various submissions, and can I thank those who did put in a, a submission in advance of today's roundtable, that's immensely helpful for the committee just to tease out some of the uh, recommendations and um, issues around defamation. But one of the things was it wasn't the level playing field, it can have a chilling effect, um, we don't quite know the boundaries that you can go in investigative journalism. Um, so would you like to comment on, on that kind of aspect, this chilling, if you like, effect of the public debate in Scotland? Rosalind? Well, I suppose in the nature of what I do, I, I see this every day. Um, nobody wants, uh, well, I hope that most journalists are reputable professionals who don't want to sail too close to the wind. But certainly there are stories, uh, again, very near home, Savile, you know, Jimmy Savile. Uh, it is difficult to know, it's always difficult to know, and there are a lot of lawyers around this table who are not necessarily media lawyers, it is always difficult to know whether you're going to win or lose a case. The stakes are always pretty high once it becomes litigious. You are on the back foot um, as a speaker with, with the way the law has evolved um, with defamation. So it, it, is, it is very often easier to kill or to restrict a story than it is to run it. Yeah. Nick? So I think it's important, going on from the last question, is that it's not just journalists who are publishing content that could be in the public interest now. So we have independent bloggers, we have social media users, and we have publications that do not have in-house legal support or, or legal guidance. So the requirement, things, you know, the, some of the re reforms that have been put forward by the SLC, such as serious harm threshold and the public interest defence, I think are vital to ensure people one, know what, how, how the law protects them or may threaten them, which, we need, which is why we need a um, sort of a comprehensive, up-to-date law. But also, they, they know what um, um, sort of protections are available. Um, at the moment, public interest based on the um, uh, Reynolds defence is far too narrow. It's still very much framed around an exclusively journalistic bent and not... And it, so there is sort of, I would say, uncertainty for other people as to how that protection may fall. And we see, obviously, the, the ongoing case with Andy Whiteman, seeing, as a, for us, as a perfect example of the need for a public interest defence, which I think is... And without that, and without serious harm thresholds, so the possibility of still vexatious or frivolous cases, or cases brought just to silence criticism, can still sort of, sort of have an undue impact on free expression. And we've seen it through talking to editors, journalists, bloggers, um, some of our own members, um, that, is, that is a case that we need to look at. Now, we've brought up um, some things here which we will go back to in more detail, the, um, the Savile, you know, the definition of the dead, um, the public interest, which we'll have more questions on. And, um, yes, Campbell. I form a different view from that. Um, I am not aware, I've acted for newspapers and publishers for 20 plus years, and I'm not aware of the scenarios which are portrayed as being the um, the vexatious cases, the if you the, the, the man with money raising proceedings purely to to stop um, freedom of freedom of expression. I don't believe that exists in Scotland to the same extent that it does down south. Um, partly because of the the jurisdictional basis that proceedings are more likely to be raised down south than they are in Scotland. Um, the, I, I take on board Nick's point in relation to the fact that bloggers don't have legal advice, and that is one of the reasons why there needs to be reform. I, get, I absolutely get that. But the argument that 
there are vexatious and frivolous cases raised in Scotland in defamation is news to me. Okay, um, no doubt we'll get into that a little bit further, but can I hear from all the panellists first of their examples? And there's two supplementaries, Liam and John Finney want to come in, which I'll bring you in a minute. Anyone else want to talk about the chilling effect and maybe examples? Gavin? Yeah, um, one point that I think uh, often gets forgotten in this debate, and certainly did in England a few years ago, is that it, it's very easy to raise the spectre of the bully who wants the press not to publish but sometimes the press can also be the bully uh, of the little person who can't afford to sue, and it can cut both ways. And I think there may be a question of plurality here in that some media organisations are better placed to advance themselves than others in the context of the press where they can editorialise, and that can create an imbalance in our wider media picture, which may be an academic concern and a concern of uh, a separate nature possibly, but I think there's a possibly a butterfly effect in that extent happening there that is often not thought of. It's not necessarily all on the case of the, mm. the pursuer, then you know, the, the defenders too in the media can and be um, fairly powerful too sometimes. I think so, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think, John Paul, you're the only one we haven't heard in this general kind of question. Yeah, ju just very briefly, I mean, the law societies are generally a neutral view in terms of this because other than anecdotal evidence, we don't have any substantial body of evidence to say where the, where the power lies in these things. The only thing that I would say in response to what Gavin has said is that in terms of the little, the little guy being able to sue the papers, um, that this, this Parliament has, has taken steps very recently to try to address that in terms of the Civil Litigation and Expenses Act, which has just come in, which would, uh, in the right circumstances, make it more, uh, give, give greater access to justice to, to those individuals uh, and funding options, which you know, last month weren't available. The David and Glyde scenario yes. that they were addressing. Okay, and Nick, bring you back in. I think just um, uh, to Campbell's point, I think there are... I mean, obviously, a lot of the challenge has been that if it doesn't come to court, how do, where do we see the chilling um, taking place? I mean, one of the cases that we followed was the National Collective um, story in 2014, where they reported on uh, donations during the Indie Ref, and they sought a lot of their material from public, publicly accessible documents, previous newspaper articles, um, and they were um, issued a legal letter that required them to take the website down for a few days. And it was only through pro bono legal support that they were able to and establish a sure legal footing. But following that point, they had more sort of conventional press. I believe it was the Herald, potentially, who covered that story and were able to ensure legal due diligence has been taken and, and they, did not, they did not have to remove or, or take down anything. And this is going back to the sort of in, um, in, inequality of arms for without legal um, representation, people may be more cautious than they potentially need to be. Um, and, as, and also the idea that people may target smaller organisations. And we've seen similar um, threats of other bloggers because they know that they are less likely to defend themselves. Now, there's a number of members wanting, and as always, I give um, priority to panellists and hearing their views. But we'll start with Liam, John Finney, and Daniel have all indicated they want to come in. John, Liam, Kev. Thank you, Convener. Uh, just very briefly, if someone could walk me through uh, a couple of points that were made, uh, John Paul and Campbell particularly, uh, in terms of the cost of this, uh, such that if, if I believe I've, I am defamed uh, and I want to run a claim, what cost estimate, Campbell, would you be giving me at the start of the matter? Uh, if I am uh, the defender, what cost estimate would you be giving me to defend that all the way? And ultimately, who's going to pay that? It will depend on various uh, points. You could do it on a speculative fee basis, if, but you're only going to do it on a speculative fee basis if you're coming to me and you're giving the, the facts and circumstances and I'm saying, yes, there's a reasonable prospect of success here. So only then are you really likely to have a solicitor advised to do it. The cost of a case going to debate in Scotland at the moment at sheriff court level without council involvement at all, where you would have an argument as to whether the article is, or what has been said about you is capable of bearing a defamatory meaning, and that's the test. So if you succeed in that particular point at debate, it is likely that the defender will throw the towel on. Because if you're able to show that what has been written or said about you is, has the capability of defaming you, 
And then at that point, the convention has it that the defender is unlikely to go to proof unless they've got a cast iron defense to it. Um, the cost of that, I would estimate, are getting to debates roughly seven and a half thousand pounds, maybe slightly more. If you've got counsel involved, you can double that. Um, the cost of proof really depends on how long it's going to run. But I would, in essence, from point A to final determination by a sheriff, you're looking at, I would say, about £25,000. For the avoidance of doubt, the point that John Paul was making uh, is that because of the reforms last month, I, as pursuer, will get that back? You'll get probably two-thirds of that back. There's always a non-recoverable element. Thank you. John Finney. It was a point to, to, to Campbell, and it was about you saying, Campbell, about you weren't, being aware, you weren't aware of proceedings being raised in the way that would, would prevent. Yeah. Is, is the issue not, as is the case with the public sector and their fear of litigation from corporations, that it's the threat alone is sufficient to deter? It can be. I'm not going, I'm not going to deny that. But um, if, so far as a chilling effect is concerned, there is always the availability of an individual, as Nick said, they got pro bono advice in relation to that. There's always the ability to pick up the phone to a solicitor who specialises in that particular field and say, um, I've had this threat of legal action against me in relation to our publication of the following. Um, what is your advice? Now, that needn't be expensive. And in many cases, it is done pro bono. I will regularly have people on the phone who want a five, 10 minutes of, look, the following's happened, what do you think we should do? And regularly won't charge for that particular piece of advice on a pro bono basis. Okay. Thank you. I just want to test the point uh, 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 regarding equalisation just a little bit. I mean, I, I understand that if you raise the threshold at which someone can claim they've been defamed, that will therefore just potentially take a, a kind of a, a section of types of stories out of the possibility, of, or out of the scope of the possibility. Of, but, but, but in the end of the day, you know, wealthy people and organisations will always be able to lawyer up and, and, and pursue. So to some extent, I just wonder how, how far uh, a change in defamation, and in particular sort of the, 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 the threshold of serious harm, w will level up. Uh -huh. But if you could answer that question, because we want to explore, we're looking at, you've mentioned you've got to prove that it's defamatory, um, but the serious harm will, will be a new way of looking at it. But if you could answer that question just briefly. I mean, uh, working with our colleagues... I am um, working with our colleagues in English Pen and the Library Reform Campaign. They've already documented a significant downtick in cases being brought in England and which they can equate to the serious harm threshold. I mean, obviously, that is still a legal parameter that's being tested and it's still establishing its footing. You saw it recently, obviously, with the Hopkins Monroe case. Um, but I think, I mean, for us, it's a, it is a significant, and we're not for harmonization for the sake of harmonization, but a serious harm threshold is significant to dissuade vexatious claims or the claims that they are just there to silence criticism. And without the serious harm threshold, that stifling can take place before it comes to court because the receiving of legal letters and knowing that there's no threshold may be enough to dissuade further publication or to, or to withdraw. So I think at the moment there is um, growing evidence that it is establishing a significant roadblock. Campbell? The, one of the reasons why the English reforms were brought in in 2000, or the Acts passed in 2013, was to stop that particular problem of the vexatious claims. So they raised the threshold to try to deal with that. The point that I'm trying to make is that we do not have the vexatious claims that they have in England. We have very little defamation cases in Scotland. So absent the vexatious claims, where is the necessity to harmonise? Okay, is it just a case of harmonising or is it a better test, the serious harm? It's a hurdle. It's a hurdle which didn't exist before. So you're, you're putting an onus on a pursuer in Scotland or a claimant in England to get over a hurdle which once they did not previously have to get over. So you're making it harder for a pursuer to raise a case 
whereas previously they would not have had to get over that hurdle. Now, much of that will depend on, um, ultimately there's a case in England called Le Chaux, and much will depend on um, what the, the Supreme Court decide in, in whether or not it is in fact a hurdle or whether or not it's something in the round. I, I don't want to, to go into too much legal detail on that, but ultimately that's, um, is it, is the question of serious harm just an extension of the, the test um, and the defamatory allegation or the defamatory sting still remains in play or is it a separate hurdle that needs to be, to, to be got over? In England at the moment they're looking at it in terms of the Court of Appeal decision in the show as it being um, a, matter, a matter that can now be looked at by way of inference, which is, um, would, would be beneficial if that was the case in Scotland. John Paul? Yeah. Just going, just going to add that again, from the Law Society's perspective, we, we, we have no evidence that there has been any problem with vexatious litigation of this nature in Scotland. Um, in our response to the Law Commission, we specifically asked and did be interested to see what evidence there was of the necessity of bringing it in in Scotland. And certainly the discussion paper and the report makes no specific mention of any particular problem. Um, it seems to us, like Campbell, that this is an additional hurdle for litigants who otherwise may have a legitimate claim who might be prevented getting access to justice. Do we have any outcomes that we can look at, you know, to kind of back up what you see? Well, oh, it's, how do you prove the negative? We're not aware of any issue in relation to this. Uh, um, cases currently being brought under the current rule, which is you know, the statement refers to them and it's defamatory. Well, I think, I think the issue is that this will be an additional hurdle for them to go over. So if the change, if the if this serious harm test comes in, it will make it more difficult for someone to prove because they will have to prove not only that the comment was defamatory, but also that it led to to serious harm to their reputation or financial standing. Rosalind, this is a more general point than serious harm, and it goes back really to what John Finney said. I think it's it's very misleading to look at, at um, Scottish defamation law in terms of which cases are raised. It's true there aren't very many cases raised. It's, it's something which, which I deal with every day. It's the chilling effect side of it. And, um, you know, I, I can't, in, in this forum, obviously share a lot of what's confidential to, to, to the people that I act for. But certainly, you know, speaking as the person who legaled, you've been trumped when it showed on, on BBC TV, I, w I would think that um, the chilling effect is, is a real and present danger for investigative journalism in Scotland, certainly every week, if not every day. Right. Uh, Liam, um, on this aspect of the serious harm test. Yeah, so a um, couple of matters arising. Why are there fewer vexatious claims in Scotland, notwithstanding a lack of a serious harm test at the moment? My, my guess would be the, the fact that the Scottish law awards a lot less, um, a lot lower levels of damages and a lot lower recoverable fees. If you look at some of the awards in the courts in England and Wales, and the costs that are able to be recovered, um, they're eye-watering relative to what the Scottish courts would do. And I think people, if they're in a position to choose which forum to sue in, would elect not to sue here. A fair answer, Campbell. Yeah, Dean. I mean, the, in Lord Pentland's journal article, I don't know whether anyone has a chance to read that, if it was with the papers or not, he referred to a case um, called uh, Kennedy against the National Trust for Scotland. And he talked about forum and how, uh, in that particular case, Sir David Eady had reje rejected a forum argument by basically saying that the correct place to raise this action was in Scotland. Now, I had the slight uh, judicial advantage, or the, the advantage over Lord Pentland that I act for the defendant in that particular case. The costs, the case is going to the Court of Appeal in July in England this year. The cost to both parties for a hearing to establish whether or not Scotland or England is the correct place to hear a case, the cost to each party will be certainly six figures. Now that is a, in England, in Scotland, that would be a, a debate, one, maybe a day, and then court of appeal a day, or the inner house a day rather, you're looking at costs of 20,000 pounds. It's night and day. So do we actually need a serious harm test in Scotland, in the panel's view? 
Yeah. Uh, Nick, it, is it? Uh, Nick, I think you, your evidence suggests definitely yes, so perhaps you'd like to lead off on the answer to that. Well, I just think, I mean, it, this is one of the key things looking at the sort of harmonization, but also more broadly sort of free expression, the sort of tenets of it. Um, and I think, again, going back to what Rosalind says, I mean, court cases um, are an uh, Im, uh, imperfect measure of how effective the law is. So you, you are having, without a threshold, uh, the sending of a legal letter, which for some pursuers can be done relatively with ease, um, and seeing the impact on that on, on, on uh, smaller individuals. I mean, there's a case of a, a Facebook group moderator in, in, in Straven who's been, had a case brought against him by a building developer. Um, Serious harm, it does require the extra demonstration of harm. And so it's not just, because without that, these can, they, they can be vexatious or they can be these, these attempts to stifle criticism. Um, and I think without it, defamation just becomes this very sort of devalued tool to control uh, the narrative, not necessarily to protect um, rep, um, your... your um, um, what's the word? Reputation, sorry. And so I think without that, at the moment, it still very much prioritises the pursuer over any defendant, uh, defender. Um, and also the, the way that this does put the onus on the pursuer to outline the facts of the case in a far more robust manner than, than there is without the threshold, I think, is the significant benefit to, to the, 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 court, the law in Scotland. Specific yeah. point. Uh, just really just following up your, your your question to to, to John Paul. I, I mean, I, I totally understand that that you raise the threshold, and therefore there are going to be some cases which cannot be brought forward. But could you just bring to life a, hypothetically what sorts of cases you think may lo no longer be able to proceed that that would have merit if changes were to be made? Could you just bring that to life for well, the committee, I, please? I, I, I'm not sure that I can give you a hypothetical example. All I would say is that. In our experience, there's no particular problem with vexatious claims, and as a general principle, legal principle, that if someone suffers a loss or an element of damage as a result of someone's defamatory statement, then they should be entitled to a remedy. This brings it a higher threshold that it says that suffering a loss is not sufficient, it has to be serious damage. Now, I'm not aware particularly of any other area of law where that's the case. Now, ultimately, that's a political determination for you to make an assessment to see whether or not the, the chilling effect or otherwise is, is, is sufficient to raise that threshold. For my part, I, I, I'm not aware of any vexatious claims in the, in the past, and there's no particular problem. It may be that others around this table have far more experience than that, but ultimately, that's a political question for you to make an assessment on. Gavin, would you like come at this point? Yeah. I think the other way to look at this question, aside from the idea of whether it's necessary, whether there are vexatious cases in Scotland or not, is whether the hurdle, so-called, it would present is actually a threat. And the one thing that, through all the English cases that have been approved at every level, and I would be fairly confident to put money on uh, that the Supreme Court won't disturb um, in the show, is the approval of what uh, Mr Justice Bean said in Cook and Midland Heart, where he said that some cases will be so self-evident, there will be no need for evidence if you get accused of being a terrorist or a paedophile. Uh, when we look at Warby's decision, in which, although they, the mechanism is what's in dispute in Le Chou, uh, his basic decisions about what, what reaches that level of serious harm uh, in uh, and the Hopkins and Monroe case uh, about um, uh, the defacing of a war memorial, I'm far from convinced that, that serious harm is a standard that presents any detriment to anybody with a genuine case uh, based on, on what we've seen thus far. Um, so I, I think that's more the issue in question and uh, the risk of using a somewhat debased phrase in politics, I agree with Nick, uh, on the, uh, the usefulness of this as a basic test as to what defamation ultimately is about. Good when harmony breaks out. Liam, did you, Liam MacArthur? Yes. To that, if, if not, <laughs> if only to defend my former colleague. Um, in that sense, is, is the definition of, of serious harm and the way that it's being in, uh, interpreted more about avoiding a situation where almost incidental damage or, 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 or fairly negligible damage um, could give rise to a, to, to a claim or a, a, an action. 
Because I think to the, to, to the lay person, the, the, the prospect of serious harm gives connotations of, of, of something far more, far more serious, far more dramatic. But what you've described there suggests it's about distinguishing it from, from fairly incidental, low-level uh, impacts that a, a blog or a news article or, or, or um, something that is said uh, could have on an individual. My feeling is it's simply about saying, does somebody have a genuine complaint rather than can they contort something into saying, this damaged my reputation? Um, it, uh, I suppose, in a sense, it might. Uh, I think there's some of the same thinking in it as was in the old Bernardine case, which was on a different point, but was the one about um, the, the golf club members thinking less of a guy because they thought he'd reported the illegal uh, one-armed bandit in their clubhouse that was unlicensed and the issue was about who who are the general audience uh, and so on but in terms of um, the, the meaning idea the idea of does it have a genuine impact on you and your legitimate reputation in society at large or can you just contort it into something that some small group or, or some some perceived slight or you know, and I, and I, where I think it can also go back is to the old idea of the difference between something which is genuinely defamatory and something which is merely vulgar abuse. And I think that's an important line to draw. Oh, sorry, Nick, Nick. I concur with Gavin the idea that this would not establish any more of an onerous process for something like being called a terrorist or a paedophile. It is, it is for the more not to devalue, but trivial, trivial cases, or uh, but en en enables a more robust process for that, those sort of marginal cases. I mean, we're talking about it as a threshold, as a, as a test that needs to be met. But for us, we've always seen it as a, it's just something requiring a stronger evidential basis to prove, as opposed to the working definition of defamation, which is still pretty, not flabby, but it can be, as Gavin says, contorted in a way, where this just requires the pursuer to actually state in clearer terms whether it's person, so serious um, harm, or a non-natural person, so ser uh, s uh, serious financial loss, is, I think, just that extra step just to ensure, um, and it may dissuade people bringing cases if they can't, if they can't make the necessary case why it is serious harm, which I think is a a better standpoint for, for the law in terms of a free speech, uh, free speech or free expression point of view. Uh, Gavin? Back on that again. Uh, what I think it might also help do is prevent the kind of case which theoretically could get all the way and then result in damages of a pound or something like that because the, the court ultimately decides, well, you were defamed, but it's not that big a deal. And that would feel to me like a colossal waste of the court's time. Uh, when that happens, whereas if the uh, if we have this in here, then you've got that built-in um, hurdle, which can be a discourager to somebody pushing a case like that, rather than having to use these sort of nominal damages as a sort of uh, warning or deterrent to other such cases. Yep. Russell? Point, maybe give you some examples of cases from, from Scots law in the past, which might be significant here and there are both cases where Scots law did deal with the issue and they dealt with it fairly promptly but at the same time a lot of legal expenses would have been paid out on, on both sides. One was when the journalist Angus MacLeod sued a newspaper for a diary, a Scotsman diary piece which um, called him the greatest inventor uh, since John, Scottish inventor since John Logie Baird. It, for most of us reading it, I think it's fair to say, it was a, it was a comic, light-hearted diary piece which was about a political prediction he'd made which didn't come off. And he took it very personally, as, you know, as many of us will take things that are said about ourselves personally. That's the sort of case where I think if he'd gone to one of the media lawyers around this table and said beforehand, I have to show serious harm, they probably would have said, well, you know, is this, you know, most people are going to think this is a bit of a joke, it's a diary piece. There was another case, very different on its facts, but the late George Robertson sued a newspaper over what was essentially the newspaper's apologia for why it had settled a defamation claim. Um, but it included the, um, the, the photograph of a cover of the newspaper referring to George Robertson sues over Dunblane lies. Now, the central allegation which he had originally sued over was very serious. It was a suggestion, a quite false suggestion, that he had been involved um, in, in the Dunblane shootings. But um, what he sued over was a repetition um, 
in, in a photographic format on a newspaper where the newspaper was explaining why it had settled, the legal basis on which it had settled a defamation action. Again, that's the sort of thing that if a serious harm test had been in place, I think a, 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 lot of, a lot of media lawyers probably spend quite a lot of time talking down clients who want to sue um, who want to raise defamation actions because they've taken something maybe a bit harder than a judge would or a juror would. And I think those are cases where it, the law of serious harm test would make a difference. It's not something I feel passionately about because when I'm concerned about chilling effect, it's less um, people raising silly season claims than people putting pressure on serious investigative journalism. But I still think it might make a practical difference for that sort of case. And it would be better all round if those cases had never been brought. It really would. OK. Um, Liam, did you want to pursue where you were going with um, serious hammer? Have you exhausted that? No, I've not exhausted. <laughs> right. Carry uh, on then. <laughs> no, just um, if we accept that the serious harm test could make it more difficult or less attractive to run a defamation case in Scotland, and if we then accept that... Scottish defamation law is significantly less developed than that south of the border. Uh, could, could bringing in this test actually hold back the development of Scottish law in this area and make it more difficult for defamation law to develop as we would want it to do? Who wants to take that on? Yes? My, my view throughout has been that, that I suspect that if the, there is harmonisation between the England and Scotland in relation to that test, that litigation will flow down south. Because there's a juridical advantage in going down south. They have a experience, much more experienced media bar. They have media courts. They have the conditional fee arrangements which are in play. Now, notwithstanding the fact that we will have a, a variant of that under the new um, civil litigation expenses and group procedures act um, there are my view has been that, that we will potentially lose the 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 cases that we would have had in scotland and that the law will therefore not develop in scotland we will become the clerk to the english queen's bench division for all intents and purposes as the cases go down south because they have the knowledge of doing it in the Interestingly, in the case that I referred to, the uh, Kennedy against National Trust, the discussion paper on the working reforms of defamation was held up by the claimant's agent as being prime example of why Scots law should not be capable of hearing the case in Scotland and that England was the more appropriate forum for the case because Scotland didn't know what it was doing on defamation. So that's, that's what you're up against in relation to the English bar. The English courts, as a general rule, hold on to, lit to, to litigation, particularly libel litigation. They like it. Um, Does anyone disagree with that answer on the panel? I do. I mean, having been involved in litigations on both sides of the borders because of the nature of the BBC's broadcasting, it's much, much, much more expensive to litigate in defamation down south. Um, I don't... I, Campbell's got much more experience of it from the pursuer's perspective than I do, but I would have thought that that was a serious deterrent. And also, it isn't about really about the quality of the, of the litigations that you have. If you've got a situation where you've got no comparative jurisprudence on what serious harm means, then, then that's so, you know, if you've, got, if you've got difference, then that can be a way of preventing the law from developing because you've got less case law coming from anywhere. And, you know, forum non-convenience, it's a pretty flexible tool legally. If, if the English Queen's Bench wants to hang on to defamation cases, I'm not sure that we can stop them doing well, that. I get that. I take that. Yes? No, that's right. I take that as a point in to um, forum, forum, but we can't, one of the things that you can't argue in forum is the juridical advantage. You can't argue conditional fee arrangements. They're not interested in that. The, the only thing that you can look at are the facts and circumstances of every single case. The difficulty in um, a, a situation of costs is that it, it, it's quite, it's almost insulting to argue that you're, you're selling your services in Scotland on the basis that you're cheap as chips. And that's really what it's coming down to. Go to England, it's an awful lot more expensive. Stay in Scotland because we're cheap. Well, speaking of someone who's, yeah, who's defend, defending with public money, the question of cost is very important 
to me. Nick? The Whiteman case is a perfect example. That's a £750,000 claim, which, was, which is basically nearly three times, no, more than three times the Scottish law record at the moment, Scottish law record at the moment, and um, also then the costs, you know, the legal costs associated with that are, are already significant. I mean, at the moment, if we look at cases like the Andy Whiteman case, even if London, even in England where they have a serious harm threshold, it could be argued that that could be met by the allegations against him. But for us, we're not seeing, and there's not enough evidence personally that we've seen that this could, this would happen if a serious harm threshold was, was brought in. And our position is, I mean, it's twofold. One is that that's not a strong enough conviction for us to weaken what we feel like is a vital free speech protection in Scots law. And also, it's something that I think we need to look at. You know, this law, you know, laws aren't always just there to, you know, it's a benefit for of law if it strengthens legal process, but also as 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 an, is economically viable in the, in the in the in in the country. But we need to look at this as what it is, which is a law that does impact um, on free expression, public accountability, and sort of and account, uh, transparency issues. And I don't believe that leaving our law unreformed to hold on to that is a significant enough justification for pushing back on this. Um, this reform. Rosalind and then Daniel. I, I agree with that absolutely philosophically with what, what Nick said, but if I could just bring it back to the grubby voice of commerce a bit, um, you know, Channel 4 is deciding at the moment where it wants to set up outside of, of London and if you're an organisation like that and you've got a choice of places to set up, is it attractive to be somewhere where you could still be sued? 10 years from when you first put the broadcast out where you can't count on certain defences that you think you've got in place, where there's not much case law. Do you know, I, I, again, this is preeminently something for Parliament. This is not something probably where a lawyer can add an awful lot of value, but I would have thought that the commercial uh, issues in play are quite complex. Okay. Um, Liam, have you finished now? Oh, sorry, but it was Daniel, Daniel wanted. Yeah, I, mean, I just really want to follow up some of the points which have just been made there. I mean, if... if the argument is that we don't want to alter the law because there is a fear that essentially we might kind of see a loss of market share, for want of a better expression, in terms of um, litigation coming through the Scottish courts with regard to defamation. I'm just wondering how good an argument that is and what we lose by losing cases. And is it is the converse of that, and it's a little bit what Rosalind was just saying, is it... it, it if all we're doing, essentially, by having slightly different laws is making it easier for, for you know, lesser order cases to be brought forward here, is that sort of not almost a sense of arbitrage which is no better than the sense that, that we're losing market share? Just, I'm slightly playing devil's advocate, but I'd be interested just to hear your responses to that. I don't deny there's an element of self-interest. <laughs> there's no... <laughs> Going to hold my hand out and say that. that, that that's, um, but yes, there's, there's. Well, what do you if you if you if you allow the litigation to flow down south, the bar, the Scottish bar in relation to that particular field, is gone. There, they will, there will be no or next to no Scottish cases raised on that particular on, on defamation in Scotland. You'll you'll end up if it being done at sheriff court level, which which is fine, but you're, it, it's not going to be the same binding cases as that you get down south. If you take it back to the absolute premise, the opening premise, which is that the purpose of bringing the substantial test into play is to stop vexatious and frivolous actions, and those, those do not exist, then why bring it in? Premise. Is it not just a better test? I think Rosalind referred to the one pound. It does go through. It's not necessarily a bit vases, but it was so um, insignificant that the award of damages was a, a token one pound. And the cost uh, that Gavin referred to of bringing that case, all of that. Well, in, prin that's for the in, in, pr in principle, yes, but, but point me to the case where one pound of damages has ever taken place in Scotland. It, it doesn't, okay. and in relation to the Andrew Whiteman case, uh, I have an interest because I'm acting for Andy Whiteman in that case, but a large part of the claim is not the salacium element of it, it's economic loss. So it's, 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 it's to do with the, comp the, the fact that the pursuer claims to have lost through his company substantial amounts of money. So it's not really, it's not really the same as saying uh, 
the high, it's the highest award in Scotland at three times the level of that. Yeah, it would be in theory, but on an completely different footing. Uh, I'll just... Um as I did to uh, the members um, pre this meeting, issue a slight warning that, of course, we can refer to the blog and um, the case, the ongoing current case with Andy Whiteman, but not in any detail as it would be sub judice. And while we're just kind of sorting things out, Rosalind, could I clarify, was it George Robertson MP you were referring to? That's right, sorry, yes. I, I think you said the late George Robertson. I hope that isn't the case. Sorry, not no, you. Neil's dead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, my fault. Yeah. <laughs> Having stood against yeah. George in the 1992 <laughs> general election in Hampton without being unduly pessimistic, with absolutely no chance of winning, I have a great affection for him. So I'm delighted to hear he's not the late George Robertson. <laughs> okay, thought we'd better just clarify that. Can we move to Nick? I, I would... Oh, sorry. I would dispute um, that there is um, Campbell's case, that there is no evidence. I think the problem is, is where, where we count the the chilling and for us it's been way before the court case but also a lot of this is sort of hovering around this idea of Scotland becoming almost like a libel haven the same way that people build in low tax um, policies to encourage people to come there and I don't think the this law which is vital for people who are expressing themselves and not just journalists this is bloggers social media users and I don't think Scots law should remain unreformed in this aspect just to try to secure secure that. I, I mean, it may, it may be a crude analogy, but I think looking at it, I think is uh, there is some relevance. Okay, thank you. Um, if we move on to Liam Kerr's position. Sorry, Liam MacArthur. Two Liams on the same committee out of 129 ASPs, just my luck. And asking questions one after the other. Um, just following on from the discussion there around um, serious harm, I think we'll maybe come on to the the, uh, the proposals in relation to reducing the, the, the time limit and in terms of um, secondary and subsequent publications. Um, I think, Campbell, it was you that was, was referring to the fact that there was not necessarily an awful lot in there for pursuers. And I'm just wondering whether actually the purpose of the reform, um, which we discussed um, in response to the convener's question, is about providing an appropriate balance or, or, or whether the, the, it's driven more by what was being discussed there in relation to advances in technology, the, um, the, the use of the web for, um, for publication of, of articles and the like. Because it does, on the face of it, look like there's a kind of recalibrating uh, more in, in, uh, in the interests of defenders than, than pursuers. But uh, we welcome comments on that. Gavin? Uh, first, on the point of uh, recalibration, uh, I think recalibration is necessary, but I would say it's my feeling is certainly the 2013 Act was not a recalibration in favour of the defendants, more in favour of a, a more even balance between the two parties, uh, which is a point. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the time limit, uh, limitation period, which has been one year uh, in England uh, and Wales since 1996, I've not aware of that having posed any significant problem. My feeling all along has been that if uh, if it really has done serious harm to your reputation, you'll move faster than, than within a year uh, in order to uh, do something about it. But certainly there, there is a great role in any difficult cases in that for the Limitations Act. Uh, I would refer there to the um, Stephen Morrissey against the NME uh, case where he was allowed, now they then settled the case out of court, but the High Court found in his favour that three years after, so long outside the limitation period, they should exercise their discretion to hear the case on the basis that he said, well, I was aware of it, but he satisfied them he couldn't afford to do it any earlier, largely because he had been too busy being a successfully sued by other members of the Smiths over unpaid royalties. Um, but that case shows how a shorter time period uh, certainly doesn't uh, present the difficulty to justice in my mind. And I'm sure there are any number of other cases we could cite, but I, I think that's a very sensible reform. And in the context of the web, uh, what online publication and the modern media has done is rapidly speed up the cycle. And I think that makes a strong case for a a tighter time period. Um, the one other point I would make would be to refer to defamation law in France, 
where my understanding is that if it's published in a newspaper, you have a, a limitation period of four months to bring your case, whereas if it's in a book, you've got the 12 months. Uh, and I'm not suggesting we go down that road of complicating things with multiple limitation periods. However, uh, I think the 12-month period is fast becoming a fairly universal standard, and uh, I think it's, it's not a problem in that regard. With a, with a discretion in, in, yeah. in particular? Yeah, and the discretion is an important point. Yeah. I mean, that would have answered the issue in uh, the Luchansky case, where the action was launched 15 months after original publication. That very easily could have been allowed on a discretionary basis, rather than the multiple publication rule, as was then the case. We're supportive of it being reduced to one year. And it's also important to know that it is um, one year from the uh, pursuer being aware of publications and not necessarily from publications. That does give a little bit of flexibility for the defender. We also, I also agree with Gavin, is the sort of I mean, anecdotal idea that if something's causing you significant harm, it's something you'd want to deal with sooner rather than later. Um, the point less specifically about the different aspects of it, but, but the, the kind of... Um, the impression overall that what's needed as part of this reform is is, is a, a sort of tilting the scales somewhat in, um, more in favour of, of, of defendants. Um, I would again agree with Gavin that it's not necessarily in favour of defendants, it's just more of a equal between the parties. I mean, it's, I would say so far it's incredibly skewed towards pursuer at this stage, so any movement that, I mean, yes, I mean, it seems to me very much the same thing. That yeah. At the moment, it seems to be imbalanced and that it tips too far in favour of the, the pursuer, either through the, the mere threat of litigation or litigation itself, um, whereas actually what you're talking about is, is, is providing more of an equity, more yeah. of a balance. So I guess if you're thinking on, on, on a spectrum, it is closer towards that, but I would say it's actually more towards a more equal distribution between the pursuer and the defender. Um, and also, I think this is all skirting around um, the multiple publication, single publication rule, which I would say is one of the most important reforms suggested by the SLC, um, because multiple publication just does not function accurately and effectively um, in terms of online coverage. You've got a case where, because if someone's just retweeting or sharing a link, that that could create, that could create another window of liability that could, in principle, continue ad, ad infinitum, and that, I think, is one of the most sort of antiquated aspects of, of, of Scott's law. I mean, that or the not requiring third-person publica third publication, which is still somewhat baffling that it still exists. Um, but it's also in interesting that um, the SLC has gone in a different direction from England and Wales um, in terms of online sort of responsibility and liability around how this sort of this cover how this, how content is deemed to be defamatory and what their obligations of the web op the website operator is and that i think is a very interesting um development especially from our experience talking to um people down south is that section five operate more of a takedown notice culture as opposed to something that actually I think we're going to come on to yeah, the, the internet I, 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 it's more in the in the sense of that issue between defender and, and pursuer i mean Campbell, you, I, I was quoting you earlier, I think, in terms of the view that um, it was shifting in that direction. There doesn't seem to be any dispute of that, but that it was seen to be a necessary um, reform. Well, with my, my pursuer hat on, uh, I think I've, I've said in the past there is nothing in it for the pursuer. There's, there's literally it's, it's the, the recalibration of the law which gives nothing to the pursuer and puts extra hurdles on the pursuer. Um, in relation to the... Uh, triennium being abolished towards one year. I, I personally have no particular issue with that. Um, the, the only case in which I've been involved where um, a, a litigant from down south who's been time barred has come up north of the border to sue was a case called Kennedy against Aldington. Um, but he was only entitled to sue for the Scottish losses that he had sustained in Scotland. Um, and that loophole will now be gone. And I think I suspect it was a loophole but the argument is not so much that if the individual believes that he's had serious harm occasioned to him, then he'll raise within a year. I form the view if he believes that he's had harm raised against him, he'll raise within a year. It doesn't have to be serious. You're not going to hang on and not litigate in that 12-month period to see whether the harm becomes more serious. If you've been harmed, you will raise there and then or as quickly as possible thereafter. Um. 
Just on the issue about rebalancing, uh, Lord Pentland, you know, this isn't, obviously it's, n it's not Nick's draft, it's not Campbell's draft, they would both look very differently, it's the Scottish Law Commission's draft, and Lord Pentland, who while at the bar, probably was, was the most experienced media law silk we had in Scotland, did act for both sides of it, so, and he has said that he doesn't see it as a rebalancing. I guess, as you say, it's... It's a question of how you look at it. It's been already been said this morning and truthfully said that in most cases of causes of action, you don't have to show that you've suffered serious harm. But also in most causes of action, it's not the defender who has the onus of proof. And for so often in defamation cases, that's, that's the way it is. You know, if, if we run a, an investigative uh, piece saying that somebody is um, a fraudster and we're, our position is that that investigative piece is true, it's the defender who's got the onus of truth. There's a presumption of falsity, there's a presumption of malice, and there's a presumption of damage at the moment. So that, you know, the only way it seems to me that you could actually rebalance uh, defamation law in favour of the pursuer in Scotland would be to introduce criminal libel, which has never been part of our law. It's, it couldn't get an awful lot worse for the defender, as I see it, which is obviously partisan in its own way. We, we touched on the internet, which is a really interesting area. Jenny. Thank you. Uh, Gavin Sutter, I'd just like to, to pick up on some of your uh, written evidence. Um, and you note that the approach taken in the draft bill in terms of online content is unnecessarily complicated. And you say that no one wishes to make life extremely difficult for online hosts or to cause a chill on freedom of expression via an environment in which distributors, especially online, become overly cautious. But are there gaps in the draft bill in terms of online content? And for example, the notice and takedown procedure which exists in England and not in Scotland? Well, my issue with the draft bill was uh, essentially in sections three and four, where it takes this approach of saying, well, we're going to, you're not allowed to take proceedings against these guys unless they get put in a list by somebody in the executive. And I, I don't see the need for that approach. I actually think the approach in the bill is very sensible now, unlike uh, some of uh, some of those in the, in the broader reform camp on libel. I don't agree with completely immunising the service providers in the way that the US did, because all that, I mean, that was done by accident in the US anyway, and I can give you the full history on that another time, but what it has achieved in the US to completely immunise them for third party content is that ultimately the content stays there and, uh, and they sit back and go, nothing to do with us, and it gets messy. Uh, what the bill, or what, what the Act rather did in 2013, and which I think Scotland should adopt, uh, was to say, firstly, you can't go after the service provider unless you can go after the real source. So the Section 10 in the Act says, fight the real enemy. Um, you can only go after the service provider if you can't really realistically go after the source. So that makes life easier for them. And the Section 5 defence and the associated regulations provide a clear notice and takedown procedure, which effectively means if you comply, you don't end up in trouble. And you're not, as a service provider, put in the position, which was always the difficulty from 1996 onwards, of having to say, well, do I take this down? and squash somebody's legitimate expression? Or am I more afraid of the big corporate interest which has threatened me that they'll sue me over this blog and now that I'm aware it's there, if I don't take it down, I've called it wrong. And we all saw what happened to Damon back in the 90s and so on. And as I say, I, I don't see any need to take an alternative approach to that uh, with this idea of uh, you know, saying, well, that's the position for some people we nominate, but other people will be immunised because that raises its own problems. Or right, does that address? Yeah. be interested in the rest of the panel's views as well. And then John Paul. I, think, I mean, from, I mean, a lot of our work at Down South has been done with English Pen and the Liberal Reform Campaign, and what they've seen with Section 5 is that while it does establish a process that the web host or the website operator can undertake to basically insulate them from, from, from liability. In practice, it's seen more as a takedown. It's still seen as a takedown process. If they're, not, if they're unwilling to go through the process, it is something they will do. And obviously, by taking down, they're positioning themselves as, you know, as a legal lawyer, as a censor, without knowing what defence that commenter may actually have um, in their back pocket. So that's why we're a bit worried of Section 5. Also, Section 5 does dis, um, discourage the use of anonymity which we 
a principle for us is anonymity is vitally important for a lot of internet users and it shouldn't be seen as something to be fought against so the web operator can still protect itself were they to receive a, um, a, a complaint on content on their website. Um, we are largely in favour of the SLC's position to define roles and responsibilities and how that manifests both online and off. There are aspects in it that we think are problematic. The, um, the sections, is it two, three and four, which outlines membership of certain criteria, so public bodies, but also author, writer, um, so author, publisher and editor, we believe that should be made. I mean, it's in the affirmative pr uh, procedure, which is good, but I mean, our gut is always to encourage changes uh, to primary legislation to ensure that the, the bill continues to represent Scot um, defamation, Scots law in its entirety. So people know what their responsibilities are and under which category they do fall. Um, and there's certain more technical issues that we're concerned about. The definition of editor is not, we're not wild on the definition of editor. Um, whereas the definition of publisher is pretty robust. Um, editor still leaves a lot of uncertainty when we look at people online and especially social media in terms of retweeting or sharing as opposed to writing original organic content. Um, we appreciate that it isn't absolutely, it's an incredibly complex aspect that this law is sort of running to catch up. And I think even section five in England and Wales, which is only five years old, is now starting to become out of date. Um, so there's always that catch-up. I know the SLC, for example, did talk about the possibility of a, a review on internet intermediaries as well, but decided that that would need to be ha that would need to happen UK-wide, not just Scotland-based, which I, pre I I respect and appreciate that tension. But it is always going to be a hard thing to 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 write into the face of any any reform. But and anything can be better than what we've got now, frankly. If I could just come in that point, I think you made in your submission the point that um, affirmative procedure gave a level of accountability, but not the the level of independent scrutiny that you think is necessary. I think because also, I mean, there's also, I mean, um, Rosalind touched on it previously, the idea of co being comprehensible, comprehensible to the layperson. Um, and while the affirmative procedure is far better than the negative procedure, which I believe was in a previous suggested draft, I think. Um, Changes to primary, I think, are always better because it does allow that extra level of scrutiny and also public awareness that this change is happening or potentially is being discussed to happen. Yeah, fair point. Um, John Paul. Yeah. Just, just briefly in, in terms of, of, of Gavin's point, we, we generally support of that. I mean, we're talking in sort of things about investigative journalism and public interest, various other things, but the reality is a lot of these things are much more down to earth than that. The typical complaint that will often come in is, an adverse review on TripAdvice or one of these things for a small B&B &B or a restaurant where someone says something outrageous. Now, if you're in the situation where you're that restaurant owner or pub owner or whatever it is, it's very, very difficult to actually get it take down. If it's an anonymous blogger and the website is hosted in Southern California, at the moment it's very difficult for those things to get taken down. You can't find out who the person is. So in the, the sense that there's an absolution given to the, the, the website host or the, the internet service provider, that's something that we think would be would be problematic from a practical point of view because it's almost impossible to work out who the true person who's posting that is. So at that point in time, I think there should be some sort of liability on the on the hoster so that at least there can be a takedown procedure because the problem is at the moment, as Gavin said, the website, take TripAdvisor, whoever it is, to say, well, it's not our problem. So it's much more straightforward, really. If it's anonymous, then it should just be taken down. Um, no questions asked. <laughs> yeah. I'll just reiterate. Like the, I do think there is an importance in anonymity that we need to look at. I mean, it's, it is an, a, a pain, frankly, um, on things around um, things like this, but it is a lot of people will not take, take part in um, their right to free expression online if they can't, cannot post anonymously um, or under a pseudonym. And I don't think that should be dealt with lightly um, or as, as or as solely as a nuisance for website operators or, or the law more broadly. Advisor type scenario where it's maybe malicious, you've gone there, you've had an argument, you just give them a bad review knowing that's going to have huge consequences for that small business or telly or whatever. Well, I, mean, I guess we don't need to talk about what, what, how those huge, I mean, I don't know how many people t put stock in one sole chip advisor review on the top of a, a number of other reviews and obviously there, you know, there, there, there are other, other defenses potentially available to you that honest opinion 
and, and also the idea that maybe they can prove the fact. You know, it's it's never it's never pleasant if you get a. I mean, I've never I've never run a hotel, um, but I imagine it's not pleasant to receive negative um, reviews. But w any process that doesn't enter in discussion as to as to the, the the core nature of that review may ignore the fact that they may have a very sound basis for that for that review. And any process that makes it it becomes the sort of reputation management process as opposed to acknowledging there may be some genuine, if robustly argued, um, point. You know, free expression and sort of a modern democracy, they're messy and then they can be unpleasant at, at times. You know, it's noisy imperfection as opposed to silent perfection. And I think we need to re realise that that is part of the, you know, that's part of the sort of expression landscape that we've signed up, are signed up to, frankly. Gavin? Oh, no, a couple of points that have been raised. Though. One is, uh, I think, perhaps the uh, Section 5 thing could be firmed up. Uh, the DMCA, which I suspect was the model for this, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the States, created a model a bit like this. And uh, that was, uh, that's very clear on exactly what your position is as a service provider. Um, in terms of anonymity, I think that's... It's, it's an important point that anonymity is of value, but we need to be very careful to defend against the abuse of anonymity online, because uh, my impression certainly is that in the, the vast majority of um, libel cases I've seen uh, relating to the internet, an awful, awful lot of them started off essentially from somebody who didn't think it through and thought, well, it's only the internet, well, nobody knows who I am, well, I can say what I like. And uh, I, I'm wary of balancing out considerations of legitimate free expression against abusive expression um, on that front. And in the other point that's been raised that um, I think is a significant one is in terms of dealing with links uh, or likes or, or sharing content where that might be movable. I think there's an argument possibly for um, having a distinct provision dealing with that, uh, which may go on the basis of awareness and what were you aware of at the time that you shared it, or that, that's something I think might merit some further exploration as to be dealt with separately. Okay, and Daniel? Just following up, I, mean, uh, I mean, I think the point you make about the sort of the... Uh, the slightly uh, imprudent, you know, posting things on the internet by somebody who didn't think it through is one element of, of the way that... And if you, but the, in recent months, we've, we've all become aware of, of kind of the, the use of anonymity by, for, for corporate and state interests. I mean, I, and, and while I think the implications there are much wider than, than simply this, I'm mean, I just wondering if you've got any sort of thoughts around that and, and, and kind of the, the, the interactions with this topic of anonymity. Oh, certainly, I mean, the, there are a lot of... Uh, dangers as well as bonuses with anonymity. If we don't know who we're dealing with, um, you know, what if it's a competitor, a hotel down the road, who's actually posting these reviews on TripAdvisor rather than a genuine customer? Or you know, I, I think it it cuts across a lot of areas. And, and while I, I do agree, um, we need to be careful. I mean, there have been important cases on the privacy side of things, such as the case around the Nightjacker blog which have addressed this idea of the validity of anonymity in the context of um, online expression. Uh, in the defamation context, I, I do think we need to be very careful that the, the law guards against those who would use the an or abuse anonymity to further a deliberate defamation in many cases as distinct from uh, you know, somebody using a pseudonym because they don't want they don't want the kids they teach to Google and find them in Rocky Horror costume or, or whatever, a sort of wild example. Nick, coming back in, uh, Matt. Anonymity is not, I mean, it is used for, you know, I have friends who are teachers who use an, uh, pseudonyms online when they're talking about political issues. But also it's, it can be a whole host of um, immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, um, uh, survivors of domestic abuse to ensure that their abusive partner may not be aware of what they're communicating online. I do not. I don't want to see an anonymity as a trivial issue that is only a tool for the malicious or the nefarious. And also, when you're talking about sort of state interests, there are other ways that it's not anonymity itself that is making 
foreign sort of interference an, an issue. It's like slack regulation. It's lack of transparency in how these platforms and processes work. It's not solely an issue at the door of anonymity. I mean, Facebook has its much maligned real name policy, which is pretty flawed, but um, it's, it is policy, and, and it's still it's still been um, um, a, a target for these, um, at, at to date, unknown actors. So I don't believe anonymity in itself is the nece necessary and sufficient facilitator of evil. Um, I would also say there is a problem, I think, in the law, in the um, SRC um, draft about the idea, about the power of the court to remove, to require the removal of a statement. For us, I think it should be a lot more narrow. If I mean, we appreciate that the court can remove content and should remove content if um, a case is found, if a statement is deemed to be defamatory. But we believe it needs to be far more narrow, so it's a line paragraph or link that's argued about. And there is still editorial control as to whether the, the overall piece can stand without that piece. We're also really worried, and this is in one of the explanatory notes, um, as the power of court to remove the, a removal or cessation of distribution on, inter, on an interim basis before the outcome of the proceedings is known. We think this is incredibly problematic, largely because there's nothing in the bill or the explanatory note to establish the, the mechanism by which that order would be reversed if the, if the complained of statement is deemed to be not defamatory. And removing something before a judgment's been made on something is for us a bit of a, is a, is problematic in our opinion. Could, could I maybe tease out something before we leave the internet, before we leave the multiple publication and the single publication rule and just how this skews against um, a pursuer. Um, under the new rule, it's only the person that initially puts the, the, um, the comment up that will be then liable to a defamation claim. But others can then repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and, and won't. So I suppose my question is, how do you stop the kind of Mark Twain um, situation where a lie can be halfway around the world before the truth gets its shoes on? And that's very much going against the, the pursuer. So how do, we, how do we address that? Because the internet can spread so quickly, so widely, uh, and without any redress to these people that are repeating and repeating. I mean, the single in, a single publication allows for um, liability to follow on from a, a, a republication if it can be proved that it's significantly changed. This, the original statement's been changed. So the single publication does allow for, for that sort of flexibility. Yes, but the idea, you know, if it's a hyperlink, the hyperlink was published when the hyperlink was published. It's not republished every time someone copies and pastes it, pastes it into a tweet. I, would, I mean, multiple publication law for us is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of the way the internet operates. Um, then you're not always republishing a, 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 a hyperlink every time you share it. It's been published when it's been published on the blog or the website. I mean, obviously, if you're writing, on, but then, as I said, the single publication rule does allow flexibility if you can prove that that it's been changed and you've you've changed it to a significant effect that it is a new a new statement. But if you haven't changed it and you're just repeating the defamatory comment per se and keeping repeating it. Multiple people, multiple people keep repeating it. This goes to the idea that if, say, I have a Twitter account with three followers and I tweet something that's been published by someone else and then someone with a very high follower base, and I like a celebrity or, or someone retweets it and then it goes to millions of people. But again, there is a process within the single publication that you can, the pursuer can prove that it's, it's, it has changed significantly to, to warrant a, um, a further um, for the potential liability. Um, the question is, it isn't changed? Well, it's just I, it, it, if it's just repeated, we, our belief is that it should stand from the original publication, because it's a single publication, and multiple publication can, in, in the internet age, can actually enable liability to run on almost ad infinitum, because you're never going to be too sure where a, where a hyperlink ends up. Mm. Rosalind? Of the, the draft bill from the Scottish Law Commission, um, in determining whether the publication is materially different, the court may have regard to the level of prominence that the statement's given, the extent of the subsequent pub publication, and any other matter that the court considers relevant. So it's quite a broad texture discretion that the current bill proposes, and that may be the answer to some of those concerns. Like white file on the, the yes. court. Uh -huh. So I suppose my next question is, when do you intervene? That was brought up in someone's sub submission. How soon? Does the court or, or you know, defamation um, proceedings under the new bill start? There's various different points it could start. 
I can't remember who addressed that in one of the submissions. Was it you, Nick, or Gavin? It was one or other. I mentioned earlier today that it starts from when the pursuer is aware of the... But that's, that was only why I've said now. I don't think I submitted it in, in written evidence prior. So maybe Gavin did potentially... In terms of, so I can clarify the question, please. Yes, um, I, I can't remember exactly where I saw it. Was it when it was made? Was it after a period of time further down when it was repeated? Was it there were various times or two times? In that context, uh, yeah. so I was talking about section one and was it section uh, one? the serious harm issue, right. um, which is a significant question. If you want to go back to that, um, I'm no. happy to address <laughs> it. But uh, no, we'll move on then. We can move on from that one. <laughs> Liam Kerr, just briefly on, on that. <laughs> How confident can we be in the date of the original publication? Uh, in the sense that, it, if I'm hearing right, then every time the hyperlink is copied over into a new form, even though substantively it's the same thing, it, it, could there be any, any ambiguity as to what is the original publication date? And wouldn't it be with a one-year limitation wouldn't it be open to, uh, I'm getting towards the end of my one year limitation, I launch proceedings, and then suddenly it turns out there's an original publication two months prior to what was my original one year limitation, and therefore I'm out of time. Isn't that possible? If, I mean, again, it, it, it's only actionable once you're aware of that publication and the year starts, the, the, the limitation time starts from that, not original publication. Ah, from awareness. But, um, but original publication, I mean, online especially, I mean, I'm not a tech guy, but when a post is published, you can, you know, it's in the, in the, met the metadata of the website that a lot, most things are identified as when, when it's published, and that's, hard, that's a very hard thing to sort of fictionalise. But I would have to defer to someone with a more tech background than me. Gavin? Yeah. I think that may also go back to the serious harm issue in that if there was this complete lack of awareness of it, then maybe we might argue that there's not been serious harm to reputation as a, a knock-on, because I would imagine most people who find uh, they're suffering the effects of something like that would start to question and, and work backwards. Um, on the other uh, point in your example, that might also be a case where the court could be petitioned to exercise its discretion under the statute of limitations to hear the case anyway in the interests of justice. So I, I would see that as a natural fit there to, to mop up any awkwardness in that sort of situation. Thank you. Rona. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, can I, I'd like to ask you about the codification of the common law particularly with regard to the definition of public authority. Uh, the draft bill bans public authorities from suing for defamation, but that could cover a wider um, spectre because that would bring in, could bring in universities, housing, housing associations and the like, um, who may need to protect their reputation from time to time. So can I ask if you're happy that the bill does a good job of codifying the law in, in that area? Yes, Campbell? Um, where I struggle with it is in relation to the subparagraph 5, which is the, for the avoidance of doubt, nothing in this section prevents an individual from bringing defamation proceedings in a personal capacity. And I struggle as to what that actually means. Um, so if you have a situation, <coughs> heaven forbid it's not going to happen, but if you have a situation where an MSP or an MP has a a relationship, um, an adulterous relationship within Parliament, then they are acting in a capacity, they're acting, they're acting in a personal capacity there. Now, it's not defamatory to accuse someone of, for example, having an adulterous relationship. That's not a defamatory statement. But you would, in theory, in that situation, if you were litigating it, you would, and it wasn't true, you would argue that the, the sting of it is the hypocrisy angle, that the, they're having a, a relationship behind, this, behind a partner's back. And if the political party who is assigned, or that person's a, a, a party of, has a general principle of family values, then you're suing based on the hypocrisy on the party doing that. Now, where is that a personal capacity? That would mean that in those circumstances, I don't see how 
you could, or anywhere in that situation, as a member of parliament, could raise proceedings based on that particular circumstances. Nick? I mean, it is, a, I mean, it is one of the more sort of complicated aspects, and I, I think it is, and it does have that um, sort of vagueness to it. I mean, the way that we've sort of looked at it would be that, say you're, I don't know, a finance minister for a council or, or, or someone who's in, in, um, in control of the fi finances, um, and an allegation has been put to the, to the council that is deemed to be, you know, incorrect and potentially defamatory, while the council themselves would not be able to bring an action if the action was personally identifiable enough to an individual within that authority, they could then potentially try to make a case for it, which that does raise some, some, some concerns. I mean, there was a case in England, I can't remember the case, where someone within a, a council brought an action and basically he was bankrolled by the council themselves to bring the action which is, you know, could be seen as undermining the Derbyshire principle via the back door, which we think is, a prob is, a, is problematic. I mean, I know the Faculty of Advocates raised an interesting issue when, you, when looking at sort of the individual, where does the public and private stop and start with individuals such as MSPs or MPs or councillors? Um, and where does the, yeah, where's the, 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 the grey line between that? And I acknowledge that it is a, it is a complexity inherent within it. As an example of that, you know, as an MSP, if we get a constituent coming with complaining about, say, a housing association, and they, they go to the press about it, and they name an individual that works there, and they absolutely, you know, destroy them in the press, um, that housing association would have no redress under this um, new... Our reading, and I don't know, obviously other people in the panel may have a different reading, would be that the housing association themselves would not be, but if it was if they had identified an individual within, so the individual that potentially works. can as a can. public, as, as, a as, private, a, as, an individual. as a private individual, yeah, from my course. understanding. Yeah. John Paul, then Rosalind. From, from my point of view, I think that the, the drafting leaves a lot to be desired in terms of this. I mean, both in terms of the individual, about what, what recourse they have, but also the, the wider question you started with in terms of what is a public authority, does it cover universities, does it cover housing associations? And I think the, the, the sort of subsection five, which which uh, was referred to, was added in following initial feedback. The, 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 the draft, which is in the report, is different from the original draft. And the subsection five, which was the one for the avoidance of doubt, uh, a person can still sue in a private capacity, is intended to deal with this. But it, I don't think it does deal with it. If you take, for example, a historic one, which everyone will be aware of, um, Jonathan Aitken uh, was was accused of uh, effectively, ca or sorry, with Neil Hamilton cash for questions. So you're you're an MP, you're performing a public function, you're accused of of effectively abusing that public function by taking cash and asking questions in Parliament. Now he's entitled to sue under that rule in a personal capacity, but in what sense has any of that to do with his personal capacity? Uh, in my reading of that, there would be no entitlement to sue for defamation at all as an individual in those circumstances, which I don't think can possibly be the intention. And equally, the phraseology used could cover all sorts of um, people who exercise a public function. Um, it could potentially be senior civil servants, it could be people in the NHS, it could be other things who are performing a public function. And the way the test is set out is to do with the way, the way it's funded and the, the, the functions that are there. I think that's potentially very, very wide, and I'm not sure that that would be the intention. So what would you do to improve, improve or, or, or alter it? Any suggestions on how that could be changed? I mean, is that, does that need completely looked at again, that whole area? Our view is that it does need looked at again. I mean, there, there is... I mean, the public authority is defined in various pieces of legislation for all sorts of things, and I see the Law Commission have referred back to the, the human rights test. Um, but I think just the way that... Because of the specific instance of, of here and what it's to do with reputation and, and protecting reputation and harm to that reputation, I think you need to be very careful about that. I mean, the, the specific feedback that we as a society had was from the university section. Obviously, it's, it's, it's a very important sector for the country as a whole, and the universities were concerned that their reputation could be damaged and they would be not be able to be doing anything about it. I think that's a legitimate concern. Gavin? Um, that that problem is already here. It's not that it's not a real problem because it is, but the, the problem from the pursuer's perspective of when you've got overlapping 
public functions and questions of, of personal integrity, or from the defender's perspective, a concern that um, a corporation, a powerful corporation, could subvert um, public discourse by putting, a, putting an individual victim's face on an action. That's already here under Derbyshire. So it's not a solution, but it's, it's, um, it's an existing problem. Maybe this is an opportunity to fix it. And Gavin? It's a difficult area. I mean, as Rosalind says, it's very much one where there is an overlap. I would argue an MP who is unfairly accused <coughs> has been both personally defamed and their, their party, if you like, has had its reputation maligned and the party can't sue. I don't have a problem necessarily the individual being able to sue. Now, uh, as Nick has said, that has been. There have been a number of cases actually in England and Wales where local councils have been through the back door funding the individual on the basis that although they can't sue, when the individual clears their reputation, the council's reputation is also de facto cleared. Um, I would suggest maybe one thing we can look to here is uh, in the area of privacy law, we've got some very developed case law on, on the issue with public figures, the Campbells, the Mosleys, and so on, and to the distinction between what's genuinely in the public interest about the private, and that distinction between the, uh, the public person and the private person and where the various interests fall, and we could learn a lot from that sort of thinking applied in the defamation context. I think it always is going to be difficult. I mean, the other area I see that presents a similar difficulty here is um, when you're talking about a, a body who primarily trade for profit um, and those sorts of things, private bodies acting in a public capacity, you need to bulletproof that. Otherwise, what well, you also have the danger of is what if a local council, for the sake of example, decides to avoid any possibility of, um, uh, you know, being held accountable for decisions by farming them all out to uh, outsourcing them to private interests who may be in a position to then sue. You know, that relationship needs clarified in a similar way. Nick had that too. Can I be clear on this? Are we talking about commercial confidentiality being a catch-all and stops information and any more probing about, you know, what is actually being delivered and there's no way of challenging that? I think it happens all the time just Yeah, now. I think essentially if you are a, whether you're a catering company or you provide eye tests, whatever it is, to the NHS, if you're functioning in effect as part of the NHS, you should be treated in exactly the same way as the NHS in terms of legal accountability in all aspects, including defamation. Nick? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important um, issue we have here. Um, obviously, Derbyshire Principle has been around for a while, so this is just codifying it, which I think is good to have the, 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 um, all, the, all the relevant law in one place. Um, but there, it, this does bring a inequality around, and almost, almost like a sort, of a sort of a lottery, depending on what how protected you are depending on who de who delivers your public service. So if I was in, say, Glasgow and all public services are delivered by the public body itself, but then in know, Argyle, the same thing is being delivered by a, a private company but delivering a public service, the people in Argyle potentially are not protected in the same way that I would be because, I, because the Derbyshire principle would protect um, me from response from the council but that's not the same for for the corporate body i mean we are one of the few more radical people calling for corporations to be removed from defamation law but even outside of that this does require this does demonstrate a very problematic tension and russell picking up gavin's point about privacy there's also you'll be fed up hearing about the general data protection regulation but um in living identifiable individuals will always have their accuracy rights in terms of data so there's another route in there for, for personal integrity is the concern that's helpful um mary thank you um, i'd really like to raise the point of defamation of the dead and i know that's something that's uh, been discussed a, a number of times in parliament so far there had also been a petition to the scottish parliament on this as well and it was really just to get each of the the panelists of views on whether whether or not you think it should remain the position as it is at present where you can't uh, defame the dead and do you think that's the correct position that we have in Scotland and I would also be interested to hear if this is something that is in operation in other countries or if there are other examples that you think we should know about. 
Who'd like to take that one? Nick and then Gavin. We, we, we recognise the, the distress that can be caused from um, things that would fall under the sort of remit of defamation of the dead. I mean, but for us, it's, it, would, it fundamentally alters the nature of defamation in the way that it, it, it operates across society more broadly. I mean, we were supportive of the SLC's omission of it from, from the bill um, for a number of reasons. Um, also, the fact that it can um, really limit... Um, investigative journalism after the fact, things like the, uh, the Jimmy Savile case, which um, uh, Rosalind's already mentioned a lot of that. And during his life, he had relied on legal threats against people bringing coming forward. Um, so de defamation of the dead could could continue that chilling effect on on scrutiny. It's also, I mean, distress can be remedied through you know press press standards, regulations, editorial codes, and, and existing laws that pre prevent harassment could also establish a sort of uh, a mode of recourse for uh, others, I guess the surviving families or, f or, or friends um, and it's a it is one of the more distressing parts of defamation law but I think our position is that it, it, we're we're supportive of it not being in the bill mm -hmm. yeah. yes, no, I'm, I'm completely on board with that uh, one of the earliest maxims I learned as a law student was that hard cases make bad law and I'm aware of the, the Watson case in Scotland, which I think has driven a lot of this debate up here. Um, this is actually an area I'm, I've been writing about where, with a colleague and we hope to publish within the next year. But um, my feeling is it would extend defamation dangerously, partly in terms of things like the Savile case and so on. But defamation itself is about the impact on a living individual or legal person uh, as it's ongoing and a negative impact on this. The, uh, these cases about defaming the dead are all about, um, and certainly the Watson case, it seems to me more about the impact on the parents and the family. And I feel there are other better ways of addressing that, um, you know, including, uh, for example, uh, from what I've read of the case, a lot of what they're complaining about feels like it would be better dealt with under harassment. Um, and, and that sort of uh, legislation rather than extending defamation. And I mean, more broadly, uh, I have been involved uh, within the last couple of months. I remember uh, one argument I was involved in online under a pseudonym um, over uh, the Churchill and historically was Churchill a racist and a drunk and that sort of thing. And I think it's important and healthy. We should have those debates uh, and, and this could only stifle it and I don't feel this is an area where we could usefully separate private and public people and so on and, and say who's fair game on that front. Um, I think this is very much an issue about, as I say, the impact on the living relatives left behind and there are better ways to address that than expanding defamation. And that would be under harassment. Any other ways? Um, well, harassment, as Nick said, press behaviour. Uh, you know, all the stuff in uh, about um, public pursuit and uh, uh, rules on news gathering and is there an invasion of their privacy in terms of what's being published and, and to what extent is what's being published, you know, what is, uh, th there's, there's stuff clearly that's negative and inappropriate, but there's also a lot of stuff that will be published around cases like that, which is difficult and unpleasant and for the, the relatives, but, which is a matter of record and fact and, and to an extent, a free expression issue. Okay, and Rosalind? Um, probably predictably, I would endorse what, what Gavin and, and Nick's view on this. Is, this was a matter which has received a lot of, of careful thought in the recent past, and I, I don't think it would be a good idea to revisit it. But just in relation to the specific point that, that Ms. Goodjun raised, I'm aware that I think both Malta and Slovenia have got defamation of the dead as part of their code. They're the only two I know about, but I haven't made an exhaustive study of it. I think even in the civilian law tradition, it would be a bit of an outlier to have defamation of the dead, but some, in answer to your question, some states do have it. Mary, yeah, sorry, Gavin. I think there's something in Romania, I know many years, but 20 years ago, a relative, a descendant of Vlad Tipis attempted to sue Francis Ford Coppola uh, because he had made a connection between Dracula and Vlad the Impaler. Um, there is, I'm told, something in Chinese law as well, but uh, Chinese law is a bit of a closed shop 
to outsiders, unfortunately. But uh, but it's, as Ross says, it's very much an outlier and certainly not the universal standard we're fast heading towards. And uh, I would say the impact of cases like Savile mitigate very heavily against it. Oh, well, clearly it's um, a, a big issue for, for the Watsons, so I think the fact that you are suggesting an alternative way to um, address it rather than through defolition may give some comfort there. If there are no other um, questions, which there aren't, and no other opinions to be had, can I thank you all very much for what I think has been a very productive um, roundtable uh, session on defamation. Our position here was we were looking at the possibility of maybe bringing this forward as a committee bill. We very rarely do that, practically never in the Parliament, partly because it's a very complicated process, which is another issue. However, having done that and pressed the issue a little bit, it seems now the government is going to take it forward, which is, I think, a welcome step forward, and I'm sure they will have found, um, as committee members have this morning's session, particularly worthwhile. So thank you all very much for attending. I now um, suspend uh, to, oh no, in fact, we can, we can take questions, witnesses, yeah. That concludes the public part of the meeting. Our next meeting will be on the morning of the 14th of June when we'll take evidence from the Secretary of State uh, on, um, on the Secretary of State for Scotland and Brexit. So that's, in fact, later this week. So with that, I now suspend to allow witnesses and the public gallery to clear.